Hidden Object Guru here, joined by... The Unabridged Game. To talk about... I mean, uh, it's... I was... I hesitate to say the word best. Uh, because it is the best um, open world zombie game. That's just a fact. Like, there's... There's nothing else that can compare to this thing for best open world zombie game. But, like, if I had played this last year the way I probably should have, there's no doubt it would have been on my 10 best of last year list. Mm -hmm. Like, without hesitation. I'm, and I'm shocked it took me this long to play. Uh, I bought this game the day it came out. I just never got around to playing it. That seems to be a recurring theme. I keep talking to people and they're like, yeah, I've actually been sitting on that. Yeah. It, it had that weird effect where no one actually seems to have wanted to pull the trigger on it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's we're talking about Days Gone, obviously. If the title of the video didn't make that clear or the fact that there's footage of Days Gone on screen right now, just in case. But I know I'm not I'm far from the only person who picked up a copy of this game and then said, "Oh yeah, I'll get around to it." But it's like you're you look at it and they say, "All right, it is 60 hours of zombie biker survival. And on some level, you're like, yeah, that, that sounds awesome. But it's still 60 hours you have to commit to one game that is a completely unknown quantity. Not only that, but by many genre standards, a lot of people were like, oh, it's open world. And oh, it's a zombie game. And oh, it's a survival game. Like, there's a lot there that overlaps, unfortunately, with a lot of other things. Yeah, and that have there's no way, nice way to say this, that have been, you know, mediocre things in the past. There are plenty of mediocre entries in this genre, right, that make people a little nervous. And I, I seriously do wish you had played um, uh, The State of Decay so you could understand why this game impressed me so much. Because it does exactly what State of Decay does, only better. Like, and that's that's the whole story of this. That is yeah, just you're making me morbidly curious Decay. every time you say that about Steve K. It's like, do I actually want to play this? Because it sounds like I will regret it, but also be deeply amused. Well, but then that's the thing. You don't have to play the whole thing. You just have to find out how fascinating it is the that this game does everything right that State of Decay was trying to do. The only thing you can say about State of Decay is... The, um, the real life simulation is kind of interesting. I mean, I can understand people being bothered by the huge amount of time you have to spend scrounging for food, but that is, you know, the kind of simulation a lot of people appreciate that does not come up in this game uh, at all, right? And I would say that it's uh, pretty damn solid when it comes to zombie hordes and zombie combat and, like, getting you the thrill of being chased by zombies... Right, in the same way, it's just that this game does it so much better, and that's the difference. Like, it is just a better experience in every way. It is um, there's there's obviously better writing because there's basically no story in State of Decay. It is just entirely an experience. Right, the traveling is more entertaining. The world is more interesting. The zombies are better. Like, it's, it's generally, I think, in every way a better experience, but I maintain that these guys, Ben Studio must have played State of Decay, said, huh, you know, we could do this exact thing a lot better, and that is what inspired them to make this thing. I have no proof of that, obviously, but given uh, my experience with the two games, I can say that I am 100% certain that is the case. Uh, so now let's get started with just telling people to buy this game. Yes. Could you please Play buy this game? Days gone. Uh, don't let the fact that it has a mediocre title keep you from playing this game. I don't think Days Gone is a very good title. No, and I also think that just you know, like by the, a lot of the things that it has going for it to by default, like Deacon just doesn't look like he's going to be that nuanced a character. He looks like generic gritty male protagonist number forty-five. No one looks at him and goes. Oh, sure, this is someone who will actually have some emotional depth and complexity, some nuance. <laughs> sure. What's that? He's a, he's a, some goober on a motorcycle? Yep, all right, well, I've seen this a thousand times before. And you haven't. Like, he is a fully rounded character. It's Sam Witwer, who I think people remember from Force Unleashed best. But he's also done a ton of television work. Uh, and he has, I mean, it's hours and hours and 
hours of acting he did in this thing. Like, it's an entire season of television he's done for this ga video game. Is the sheer amount of dialogue you've got. And I'm talking, like, the story segments. I'm talking his combat barks. I'm talking about, you know... He has just... so many different varied lines for basically everything. Yeah, like, you're not going to hear him repeating things. Almost ever in the game. Like, I played entirely through... I did everything. 100% of the whole game, and... I never got tired of hearing his comments on things because there was always something new and in character for him to be saying. I feel like that's also something that's worth saying is that by comparison to a lot of games, pretty much everything clicks together cohesively. Like, I kept expecting, okay, here's the point where the game is going to start to fall apart, or this is the point, because a lot of games, statistically speaking, less than 40% of them in pretty much any player base for a game isn't going to finish it yeah but so as a result a lot of games tend to not worry about it in fact famously borderlands 2 anthony birch explained that's why tiny D tina's uh dragon keep quest dlc is the real ending to borderlands 2 because they figured okay if you are actually playing to this point you actually care about the plot whereas people who just bought the base game they're not going to care that much which is why the actual ending to borderlands 2's base campaign just isn't that eventful by the way, that is the number that always shocks and depresses me the most. That yeah. uh, that on average, less than 40% of people who start a game will ever finish it. And that's any game. Yeah, I, I remember looking through the achievement lists for a Telltale game and just being like, really? Because you, you can finish each of these episodes in under two hours. Yeah, it's like a two-hour commitment on any given episode. It's ten hours for the whole game. You couldn't find that to just figure out what happened to Batman at the end? You've like, endured how many episodes of Arrow and The Flash? You can't make it through this. <laughs> it's so true. And something like this, I could see people, and I mean, this is what you said when you were recommending the game to me, that it's so strange that you get through this amazing story of the game, and then you realize, oh, I'm just at the halfway point, and there's a whole other map to explore. Like, yeah, it's, it, it feels genuinely like you're playing not just the game, but a sequel, and then an expansion pack's worth of additional content, and it somehow doesn't feel bloated. It all feels like it's earned and worth it. Yeah, I mean, when I got to that second map, I'm like, wow, I was already incredibly impressed by this game, but the fact that they open up this whole extra world with new concerns with new monsters with i mean they held back a whole bunch of different kinds of monsters for the second half of the game so you could still be surprised mm -hmm. you know oh, it's yeah. like there's no giant mutant bears in the first half of the game there's giant mutant bears in the second half of the game and that's the only spoiler i'll give at this point in the podcast oh yeah that's even in the trailer so yeah that's totally fair and oh i didn't I know it was in the also trailer. love that um that once you unlock that second region, you do actually, on a very rare occasion, can bump into one of the bears, having migrated further up north. Yes, yeah. They um, they unlock some of the late game monsters in the first map after you've returned to the first half. Because I, I think fantastic. that's fantastic. Yeah, that's a smart thing to do. Because you want to make sure that people aren't bored by the first half, like by the, uh, by the north map after they've seen what's down south. You want to make sure it's entertaining. Um, so yeah, let's... Uh, uh, let's just, we'll, we'll end the non-spoilery part of this here by saying that the, the game, like, the shooting is top-notch, the driving is top-notch, the story is, again, it's probably the best story I've seen in a survival game. You know, survival games aren't generally known for their fantastic storytelling, but there are so many good characters, so many wonderful situations, Deacon is such a fantastic lead that I just, without hesitation, say this is my favorite survival game story ever. And as a survival zombie game, it's better than the best survival zombie game ever up to this point, which, of course, is Metal Gear Survive. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, want to say, just really quick here, also, the one other thing I want to say before we get into spoilers is the bike is actually legit. Like, there's so many times <laughs> when it's like, Here's this gameplay feature that we're going to tell you is important, but then it's not. No, really. The bike is an inherent... It is essentially a character in of itself in this yeah. story. You live with this bike for the entire length of the game, and it's... Uh, 
I don't know how much work they put into making this bike feel like to to make the motion of the bike feel right to feel like it's got heft to it. And it really feels like this is a big, I, I think part of it is whenever you knock over the bike, the, the, you know, step he takes to have to gradually lift up the bike to ride it. There's that little moment to remind you. Yeah. Like this is a very intense machine. He's driving mm -hmm. the amount of upgrades you put into it over the course of the game to get it into finally now. Oh, I can make those jumps. I always wanted to make, Oh, I can, you know, run down zombies now without worrying about it. Like, the fact that you, it's even better than, I mean, I know a lot of people had problems with the Mad Max game. I personally really like the Mad Max game. But I will say, I think the best part of the Mad Max game is gradually built, customizing and building your car until it's incredible. And I feel that same way about the bike in this, but to an even greater extent. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, yes. Now we're going to say that, again, we're going to start talking spoilers now. <laughs> so if you haven't played the game yet, we really don't want to spoil the game for you, but this is an in-depth discussion, so please get this game. Oh, yes. Just like, the, as someone who has very vocally been a PS4 critic, this is easily the reason to have a PS4. Yeah. I mean, I would say PSVR is the reason to have a PS4, but I'm, that too. I'm a PSVR, per I'm a VR person. Not everybody are VR people. Uh, but yes, like this is... Uh, I don't know why it isn't being marketed as one of the greatest system sellers. Because it absolutely should be. PS4 has this all to themselves. And honestly, like you said, that's all the reason you need to want to go out and get a PS4. It's that good. Alright, now let's get to it. Um... <laughs> I almost don't want know where to start. There's so much good stuff about this. Oh, game. I, I, there's multiple story arcs worth of stuff to go through, and there's so many iconic characters. Um, I think actually the good place would be to start is just if, were there any parts of the narrative that didn't click with you? Uh, I will. Um, I will say one thing, right? And this is uh, this is the only thing that bought that like legit bothered me. Is that, okay, um, I feel like the Rippers are, like, Mike runs a camp, right? Mm -hmm. Runs a camp, and he wants to keep it locked down, and he wants to keep society going, and he's doing the right thing by all, by every possible definition. He is handling this the right way and doing the right thing. And mm -hmm. he doesn't want to just murder people, and he doesn't want to, you know, uh, be just as bad as the Reavers are. Like, he's, he's doing a great job. But we are asked to believe that this guy is really devoted to keeping a truce going with the Rippers. And the thing about that is, they have the Rippers being way too monstrously evil for this completely sensible character to not see what they are. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, you can't have oh, a truce. I, I, you cannot have a truce with torture cultists who are trying to, you know, mass murder everybody to bring about the end of humanity. You can't have a truce with that. I, I think the, the justification there is that Mike, yeah, Iron Mike is just too scared. I really think that's the reality of it when yeah. he takes you to that other place where there was a standoff and everyone shot each other. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I really wonder if that is the underlying reason that he just kind of goes, okay, you know what? Okay, I do not know how to handle this situation, so we're just gonna we're just gonna make a truce and put that aside for now. Yeah, and I I think you're right. That's him as a character, right? And I understand why the um why his character is so damaged by the things he saw that he's not willing to go to full on war. He's not ready to have another war with human being with human beings who just, you know, months well months ago, at this point 2 years ago, were his neighbors, right? They were, they're just all people trying to survive and he thinks that they can all do that together. My issue is not that his beliefs are unreasonable. I don't think they are particularly unreasonable based on what he's been through, but the problem is the I found the game seems to think he had uh, like an ethical or even a strategic leg to stand on. 
Oh, and, yeah. The, no, no. No, yeah, and I, I think the game, for, like, everyone should know that Mike is making a mistake here. But the only one who seems to know that Mike is making a mistake here is evil character Schizo, who then betrays Mike to the Rippers. Schizo. Oh, that guy's the worst. Oh, my gosh. And, like, they did a perfect job of making him be the worst. Just I, the worst. You instantly want to punch him for all of the right reasons, which is <laughs> amazing. Because, like, the sheer... I know people treat this word like as if it's a dirty word these days, but there just is a genuine diversity to the cast and all the different people they incorporate into the story and all the different perspectives, and it's effortless. And then you get to Schizo, and it's like... Yeah, you're 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 like you have depth to your writing, but you are still just the ultimate asshole to hate. Yes, like they the game has it's interesting how all of the game's villains right are s surprisingly complex. Like you know why the colonel is as nuts as he is, mm -hmm. right? Like I understand why the colonel is as nuts as he is. He's completely wrong in every in. Uh, I'd say 80% of the decisions he's making, but you completely understand how he got there and why he's as nuts as he is. And the game roll like completely outlines 100% clearly why he's making the mistakes he, he is. Um, Carlos, right? Carlos, I get why Carlos is the way he is. I think oh, he, 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 I, I love that there was actually a payout there because that was like, it finally made good on the whole. You notice that there's an enforcer badge on Deacon's vest yeah. and like no one's talking about it. Yeah. Well, no, the first time I saw his badge, I'm like, uh, I said to the stream when I was first playing the game, it's like, that means he kills people for the motorcycle club. <laughs> That's what enforcer means. <laughs> he's the guy who tortures people and beats people up. It means he's a bad guy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the guy whose back he burned off certainly feels that way. <laughs> uh, right? But it's like, Carlos, he's a bad guy from a bad world, and he has chosen to go all in on it. Right? Mm -hmm. He has seen the world go crazy, and he's like, I'm just going to go all in on all of the darkest aspects of my personality. And he knows this is not a sustainable course of action, but he doesn't believe in anything anymore, so he's like, we're all going to go out, but we're all going to go out happy, murdering, raping, and high on meth. So he's terrible, but again, you understand where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Where his schizo is just a dick. <laughs> and I love because the exact what you say is like, that is. Just like, even the tone, it's just like, he is just a dick. Yeah, that's it. That's the only, like, that is fundamentally, he's just one of these guys who spends his life going, well, why am I not the one in charge? Well, people don't like you. Uh, people don't trust you. You don't seem like a good person. Yes, but I should be in charge. Based on what? Based on what should you be in charge, Schizo? Learn to wear a hat, Schizo. <laughs> I know. No, but it's like, dude, if you would, if you would keep your head down, if you do a good job, if you would help people out and make them like you. No, but all you want to do is just be in charge so you can be in charge. You certainly don't seem worried about other people. You certainly don't seem concerned about making the world a better place. You've just got yourself and you're, you know, there's bad, yeah, there's bad guys out there you want to fight with and there's people you want to be in charge of, but this seems to all be about you in a way that it really shouldn't be in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. If we want to survive, it all has to be about uh, uh, accomplishing things and surviving together. Which That's all, all that should matter. One of the beautiful things about the game is that in the end, the thesis isn't nihilism, but unity. I think that's one of the big things that sets Days Gone apart from something like The Last of Us, where it's like, no, we can actually figure shit out if we oh, stop... Yeah fighting each other and if we all just work together and put our biases aside yeah and that's and and that's the thing it's like there is a there is a degree of you know misery porn to the last of us that never sat well with me yeah right? about assuming it is an entire story about assuming the worst about humanity and rev and to a certain degree reveling in that and that is very much the opposite of what Days Gone is, which is entirely about 
the strength of community to survive anything. Like as long as you put together these communities of people who are willing to sacrifice to work together to make things better, you can improve and the world can be a better place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's, it's, it's strong because the thing is, even the, the militia is making a go of it until any kind of, uh, like, except for the, let's face it, the mental problems that their leader has. Yeah, it's not a surprise when basically everyone's like, yeah, I don't miss him. When you come back to the camps, they're like, yeah, I'm good. This is, this is so much better now. Like, defenses are great. Stockpiling weapons, working on tech to fire monst- uh, fight monsters are great. Working electricity! This is all, this is all thumbs up. Did we really need the extra level of building, like, um, religious fanaticism and building an ark? Did we actually need that part? That reminds me, I, a lot of times with these sorts of games, they get religion wrong. And I do love that while it's subtle, they do also call out that, like, yeah, we know that the colonel isn't actually representative of what most people are like. Because, like, Deacon calls him out for mixing up Genesis and Revelation. I know! Yeah, no, he's only got this, he's got this, you know, um, what do you call it? This, um, uh, this overview idea of Christianity. He's just got, you know, these basic ideas and he's read a couple of things here and there and he thinks God is on his side, but it's not like this character actually does spend a lot of time with the Bible. Yeah. You know, he, he really doesn't. Uh, he's just, you know, he understands the, he, what he thinks is the idea of it. But no, in practice, he doesn't have a really great sense of what religion is or what it's for. And I really like that about their treatment of the character. They're like, no, it's just a facade he uses as part of his desire to be in charge. He's going to say that God made him in charge. And then the minute things go wrong for him, he, uh, oh, he goes nuts. And I'm not saying it's not tragic that the way things go wrong for him, it absolutely is. But he goes nuts really hard and really fast. And the T, the T was just, that was perfect. Yeah, beautiful. Wasn't that so nice? And it, just, it was so great to see Sarah actually getting to have a major thing. Because in the end, that essentially makes it so that, okay, yes, Schizo is someone that Deacon needs to deal with. But yeah. the Colonel, Sarah is the one who has the most dramatic connection. So she has the reason to be the one to actually put him down. I know. Oh. It's, I mean, the thing is, this game has a completely, it's very dark and it's very, you know, bleak at times, but it's got a completely satisfying ending. And in every, like, one of the crowd-pleasingest endings I've seen in ages. Like, you just walk away from this game feeling great about the world. (laughs) Which I think is something we really need right now. Absolutely. is something that doesn't make you feel like garbage. I mean, is uh, that's the crazy part about this game is, is this like the most upbeat a zombie apocalypse game has ever been? I think, yeah. I think it's fair to say that because just, like I said, there's everyone has so many layers, so many layers of things going on. Even side characters like Lisa, when she finally shows up at the end, it's like, oh, and this, it's like the cycle's continuing, but Deacon can be like, okay, yeah, yeah, you're, you're resistant now. I've been exactly where you've been. I know how this is going to go. Yeah. There's hope for you yet. Yeah. Oh, and Lisa will be fine. And that's the key part. Lisa's going to be fine. <laughs> can you imagine any other game doing what Lisa went through and then the end of the story is, now nah, Lisa's going to be fine. It's going to oh, be yeah, no, no, for no, no, her. No. In the last <laughs> one, she would have died horribly somehow and be just instantly rich. I'm yeah. not trying to beat on the last one. It's just like, that no, is the that's the tone of that so game. Many gamers especially. Oh, yeah, no, but you're absolutely, uh, I mean, that's absolutely the tone of that game. Is That is 100% would have happened to a character like Lisa in Last of Us. It would have just been a brutal thing. You know, it would have been a brutal fate to remind you of how uncompromisingly awful the world is and that's all it would have been for right now she just you know she needs to regrow her eyebrows <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I mean yeah she's got some nasty scars but who hasn't been scarred by this world mm-hmm. you know you know and that's the thing it's like no one who survived this world hasn't been left punished by it um i will say uh i noticed a bug in the game that really bothered me and made me suspicious 
uh, when Sarah and Deacon go back to her research facility, uh-huh. the um, the the voice in the computer is like, "You last logged in seven hundred and fifty days ago," and I'm like, "No, uh, we're oh, yeah, we're eight hundred days into because yeah. it adds days, right? Yeah, yeah, we're because that would suggest that this scene is supposed to be happening." 20 days after the start of the game which is 731 days into the zombie apocalypse and i'm like yeah um the plot of this game like irrespective of how long it takes you to actually get there playing the game the plot of this game takes place over months and months and months unrelated to whatever the number count is like it's clear that you are doing jobs for iron mike's camp for months and months and months before they trust you enough and all the reaper stuff goes down so yeah the idea that you and she and then you are narratively again unrelated to how long it actually takes in the game narratively you are hanging out uh with the militia for more than a month before you and sarah get to go out on missions together hence the tension in their relationship Mm -hmm. you know and ah and by the way, I just like, at, a, at some level, all of the tension in their relationship, I'm like, I want you to just sit guys to just sit down and have a conversation about this. But at the same time, the game completely understands the awkwardness that has to exist between these two people who haven't seen each other in two years. And they've all gone through such horrific stuff in two years, and both of them feel like, they can't be like they're so far from the person they were when they last saw they each other. They mourned which is each other. They both exactly. respectively mourned each other. Yeah. They went fully through the process of grief and now they're back. So no, it can't immediately go back to the way things were. It's going to take some time and it's a completely mature look at that relationship. And that's one of my favorite things about the game. That's I, I love that in general. That like every single character, it ends up... There's so much talking that is actually meaningful. And that is the key thing, is that it's meaningful conversations. It's yeah. like when you're helping Boozer, you know, overcome his own grief. And it's like, okay, here's your new quest. You need to find Boozer a puppy. That's, that, that was so sweet and also just so not what anyone expects or earning experience points by going to Sarah's grave and actually talking to her about the plot, both serving as a convenient plot, you know, catching you know, a little plot. recap to make sure you know exactly where the plot is. Yeah. But also showing what Deacon's actually thinking about this, because for all that he does talk, there's still other layers to his thought process that you don't instantly hear. It allows no. for so much more depth to the storytelling it reminds me of metro well one of the things i really liked is so we get the little glimpses of we get these little bits and pieces and that's why the confessional scenes are so interesting because we get these little bits and pieces about their background about the characters and then you get this wonderful scene where once uh carlos is dead after you've done the flood, after you've killed Carlos, after that part of the story is over, then he goes and he does a confessional on Sarah's grave where we finally hear the backstory. Where mm-hmm. he's like, oh yeah, here's why Car-. And it's like, because he's got to get this stuff out somehow. And there's no elegant way to put it in the story. Carlos certainly isn't going to recap what happened to Carlos. And there's and no reason for your case. character to. And it is a horrific thing. And he feels like he has to confess to somebody. So he does what he always does. He goes back to the grave and he talks to his dead wife. See, it's, it's really well done. Yeah, it just, it all clicks together so smoothly. Everything pays off in some way or some regard. The gameplay scenarios are incredibly flexible. That is another thing is that outside of the plot, but, also working within is that you can so distinctly make things work based on your understanding and appreciation for the world and how all of this works because dynamic elements across the world can mesh into each other you can clear out an entire camp by just attracting a swarm to them by the way that was my by far one of my favorite things to do in the game is to get a nice swarm on top of me and then just lead them via motorcycle (laughs) <laughs> the pike, pike camp. Will attack. Oh, every time I did that, it felt like such an accomplishment. And, well, as... and I mean, by the way, and more than once, I'd be like uh, carefully infiltrating a camp and then, you know, like slashing throats, hitting people with silenced pistol shots, 
be very careful. And then suddenly, oh, wolf attack. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wolves would kill a couple of people. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, wolves come in packs of three, so, you know, they're not that easy to, uh, they're not that easy to defeat uh, for NPC players. But yeah, watching, I mean, more than once, you would get in this amazing dynamic situation where you're infiltrating a camp, and they start shooting at you, and you take some cover, but then the shooting that they do attracts the attention of zombies... And so, you know, suddenly there's a flood of zombies attacking the camp and like, you're just hiding in the bushes somewhere, hoping the zombies don't notice you while these guys go to war against the zombies that are attacking them. Like it's, oh, this it's not like me. anything I've seen before. This is one of my favorite stories. Okay. So understand there were, I coming up on this bandit camp and I'm taking out their snipers first because there's a ton of them. Like there's more than the yeah. usual. There was like probably close to 30 of them in this camp. Right. And, um... The thing is, most of them are distracted doing something, and I can't tell what right away, so it's just like, okay, just quietly silencer taking out these snipers, and then it's like, oh, they're actually having a bit of a fight pit. Like, they, they, that is how they're keeping themselves entertained, is a fight club. Yeah. The thing is, they're doing this right next to a highway where a bunch of, a horde is just, you know, slumbering. Sauntering so, along, yeah. So they woke all of them up and drew all of this attention to themselves, and as a result, it was like, because there were no snipers to back them up, they were expecting some kind of defense for themselves. There wasn't any. So they actually <laughs> lured them in. I didn't have to do a thing. I just basically sat there and went, okay, well, uh, I guess I should go grab some ammo from my bike to handle the horde. Y'all have fun now. Oh, God. That's so beautiful, but that's just the kind of world this uh, game offers. Like, it is really a, dy a dynamic world with a ton of moving parts that interact in very interesting ways. And the storytelling just is allowed to happen as much with the dynamic stuff as it is purely through the linear scripted things. Both of them come together. They're not in isolated spaces. The open world is treated as an equal party. It's not a rock star game situation where it's like, okay, you can do whatever you want in the designated do whatever you want zone. Yep. Well, and I actually, something I really in, found myself enjoying in the game was, like, using the camps uh, that were, you know, loyal to me, that I was loyal to and getting uh, friendship with to help me deal with zombies. Oh, there's a bunch of zombies. I want to clear out this area, and it's pretty close to one of the camps, so I'll just make a loud noise, get eight zombies chasing me, run over to this farm area, and let their snipers help me with the zombies. Oh, yeah. And you and can I do, do that. That's that, a perfectly um, viable option. I do love that you confirmed for me that, yes, if you do actually earn maximum loyalty, if you are allied with each camp, all of them will actually show up with you and be like, okay, yeah, we're going to kick ass for the finale because there's not many games that would do that. Because, like, Tucker's camp, they aren't relevant to the plot after a very early time, but you can still earn that loyalty with them and make it have some payoff there. Oh, yeah. No, but I mean, um, even though, as you say, they're not super relevant to the plot, they're still interesting characters, and it was great seeing them play into the grand finale. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's an impressive... Like, they have just built this impressive world. It's full of moving parts, but all of them lock into each other perfectly. Um, like, the, just the fact that they actually... And this is, by the way, one of the only glitches I came across is... Um, the I feel like the um the what do you call it? You know, the uh the the trap that just makes noise, the rusty can trap. Mm hmm That is a slight problem because only you can trigger it. Yeah. Like, I've I've seen zombies run over those and not trigger them. And I understand where okay, well the guys whose camp it is, of course they wouldn't trigger them because they know they're there to step over it, but I've watched hordes of zombies run over those things and not do anything. And I'm like, come on, guys. You, you should have had that on lock. I mean, this it's such a minor complaint, but it's like one of three minor complaints I have about the game. The second being, when you're fighting hordes, occasionally, like, there'll be two zombies left, and even though you've killed 150 oh, zombies, you actually have to go and hunt down the other two, or the horde will somehow reconstitute. I'm like... Come on, guys. Once I hit 98%, just give me the win. One time, this is true, 
I was while I was struggling to find the last guy, he was eaten by a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> And so I got the, and I got the horde kill because a wolf ate the last zombie. Uh, but yeah, so that that was frustrating, right? And of course, the other thing is, and I don't want to be too hard on them. The crossbow is complete trash. <laughs> yeah, to the point where I don't know why they left it in the game. And like, there's trophies dedicated to it. There's multiple ammo types. Like, someone put a lot of time and effort into yeah. such a useless weapon. Oh, yeah. That just has no effect on the game. Well, and that's why I wanted to bring up my question, which is, here's my theory. And you can tell me whether you think my theory is uh, valid or not. or not? Okay. All right. Uh, you tell me if my theory uh, is valid or not or likely or not. What I suspect happened was that they they built the entire game with the crossbow and then they're like, people are going to love the crossbow. They're going to be sneaking around with it all the time. They're going to be using it. Uh, you know, they're going to be using the different types of ammo. They're going to, you know, they're really going to get into it. And then they got to the play testing phase and they're like, no one likes this crossbow. It is a hassle to use. It replaces in your inventory, like where you could have a sniper rifle or a machine gun, both of which are much more useful. Right. And, 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 but then, then they said to themselves, but basically sneaking is impossible if you don't have a silenced weapon. So I suspected like six months before the game was done, only then did they add the silencers for all the weapons because they realized no one was going to use the crossbow. That is my theory. Yeah, I'd say that's fair. I could see like that having come late down the line because silencers do like at first it seemed like i was getting a lot of them when i would loot from cars but then over time they just seemed to stop popping up as a thing yeah but you didn't buy them constantly buy them so i do wonder if that was a late addition i mean i do love them because for one of my favorite weapons the the cowboy the six shooter rifle thing isn't that thing it, great oh it, it, it is a thing of beauty i i oh my gosh, I'm going to miss that so much in so many other games, because <laughs> it was... I, I've not seen a precision weapon built quite like that in another game, and it, it just was so freaking... And that's another thing that needs to be said, is the arsenal is great, and they never cheap out and do something like, here's a handheld grenade launcher that just blows up everything or anything like that. No, you actually have to really work to have explosive supplies and things like that. You would need to collect and scavenge for real. Which again oh, yeah. is just fantastic design. Oh yeah, no, I mean um, this, and one of the nice things about scavenging in the game is, for the first half of the game, there's all of these items lying around. You're like, oh, that's some interesting decoration, but only as you get recipes that require those parts do they become pick upable. Mm -hmm. So it's like early in the game, you'll see some cords lying around. I'm like, oh, that's a weird thing to be lying around randomly, this cord. Then later you find out, no, that's the igniter for your explosives. But you didn't know how to build explosives yet. So you didn't think it was worth picking up. And so, like, the world becomes more populated with items as you unlock recipes. And I mean, I don't, I mean that in the sense that the items were already there. You just didn't know you needed them. So suddenly a room that seemed to have one or two items in it now has eight items in it because there's so many more things you can build. Mm -hmm. That's a nice touch, too. Now, I mean, it's like, it, it makes you feel like it's worth revisiting old locations because you see them in a new way now that you're there. Plus, there's other things that you can't rely upon as much. You, over time, just have depleted them. I loved that I would come to a car that, you know, a few times I'd lifted bullets from. It's like, nope, it's empty now. The world just naturally pushes you to expand your radius. Yeah, it, that's another really smart thing the game does, where it's like, yeah, you know what? When you took the, uh, when you opened up the hood of this car and stripped out the engine, now forever that ha that car is going to have the hood up and the engine stripped. Like, bodies last for much longer than I've seen in comparable games. Like, oh, dude, I murdered... The whole world's persistence is insane. Yeah, like, I murdered this breaker at one of the, the Nero camps at one point, and then I came back, like, four hours later, and the body was still lying there. I'm like, that's not something you see much in video games. That kind of persistence. Yeah, it was very impressive to me. Like, that they're putting this much effort into it. And, uh, I gotta say, I'm kind of blown away, because 
it's it's one of the most fully realized worlds it's one of the most well-built worlds like there are constant little surprises to find like i love how in the north section i mean you can do the old thing where it's like on one level you can see the mechanical elements of it okay well now you you start in forest town then you go to desert town then you go to snow town Oh, here is, you know, Burned Wasteland Town. Like, you understand the video game mechanics of it all. But at the same time, there are plot reasons for most of the locations to be where uh, the way they are. And two, it gives you these interesting vistas to check out. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, every location does have its own kind of biome, its own kind of flora, right? I mean, there's the same animals in every place. But uh, each one has its own kind of vegetation, which is, by the way, a collectible in the game. Which is, I thought, a nice touch, right? But every yeah. place has its own kind of collectibles. Every place has its own um, various lookouts. And I love the way they use the, um, the what do you call them? The 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 tourist tourism locations, right? Yeah. To try and get you to go and explore and just look at how beautiful some of these locations are. Because that's the funny part. All This broken, you know, wasteland where this is all set, well, once it was a popular tourist location. All of the... There are motels. There are tourist centers. There are hiking trails. There are, you know, historic caves with walking tours. It's such a nice touch. You know? And you don't see so much thought put into the world. Like, I can't remember the last time I saw this much thought put into the world in which a game was set. Oh, yeah. It has a handcrafted feel across everything, which I also love that that's part of the reason why there's not actually that many side objectives or things to do. There is a lot of great use of negative space for the world right. to just exist, for dynamic things to happen, which most of them are good. I will say that a lot of times the Rescue Survivors one yeah. could use some work because the voice acting for the survivors you rescue is probably the worst in the entire game. but I would agree with that. that. It just, it feels like a world where occasionally there's something you need to do. And navigating the world in of itself is the core joy of it. Instead of, here's a thousand things to do. Well, yeah, I would say one issue I have with the game, and it's not a big issue, but one issue I have with the game is the way that the every now and then you know blue question marks will pop up on screen letting you know that yeah oh, well there's a place to search or there's a person to rescue and they have they have not designed that part of the game in such a way that those things stay long enough at all like you will see them and even if you turn your bike and drive straight for them there is a solid chance that they will disappear from the radar before you get there and they vary so much that it can be hard to tell, is this just going to be a place where I can loot for more supplies, or is this going to be, like, something where actually... I'm supposed to be rescuing someone. Yeah. And that is... I mean, it's not a huge problem. I'm not going to say that broke the game for me, or, oh, I was so offended by it, but it's okay. like, they could handle... I think the game definitely could handle the random encounters better than it does. Absolutely, I would... If you wanted to make that complaint, I would 100% agree with that complaint. It is definitely an issue. But also, that's like one of the few... Th that is, we're really having to dig deep to find... We are! To ...complain about, because it just handles so much of it so effortlessly that it's like, okay, yeah, and I love that there's even more stuff to still poke around with. There's apparently a challenge mode that I really want to explore and tinker with, because apparently it throws all sorts of unique scenarios at you that you wouldn't otherwise get in the game. It has its own progression little thing, and they... Are you ready to have... You know, the thing that blew my mind, the perks you unlock, and I wish I had known this before I started, the perks you unlock in the challenge mode affect your main game loadouts. Oh so if my. You get, I know. Yeah, all of the badges you unlock in there make it easier to play the main game. That's going to make New Game Plus very interesting. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. No, exactly. I'm honestly, I'm considering starting a survival mode uh, run through the game. Oh, yeah. And the difference with survival mode is you can't use fast travel. You actually have to drive the motorcycle everywhere all the time. Which I think is actually a great thing, because that really is one of the most gratifying experiences in the game. Yeah. Well, and here's another thing I really appreciate about the game. Uh, appreciate about the game. And I don't know how you feel about this, because maybe you've got an example. 
that does it better than this game does, but I would honestly doubt that. Uh, I, I have rarely seen a game that is open world where there are such concrete effects to doing the side content in there. So I always go back to a little game called... I'm sure you played the original Mercenaries, right? A little bit. I got to play a little okay. bit. All right. Well, the original Mercenaries, you know, you're attacking North Korea. Uh, you're having a grand old time doing it. And part of the thing is destroy uh, destroy North Korean bases, right? Uh, ruin North Korean techno... Uh, like ruin North Korean ability to move their troops around. Destroy their bases, um, you know, close off their tunnels that they used to move troops, blah, 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 blah. But no matter how much you do that, there is always constantly troops everywhere. And there's always constantly vehicles everywhere. You look at Far Cry games, right? Far Cry 4 and 5, and even 3 to a certain extent. No, you take down enemy bases, but there are still enemy patrols all over the place, right? And... It is so rare for them to really make you feel like the open world is being changed by your actions. But in this game, as you take down ambush camps, and as you take down uh, infestations and hordes, there are markedly, noticeably less zombies and bandits in the world. Oh yeah, whole traps and everything are suddenly no longer a threat. And yeah. that does remind me, that is another thing that I love is that of the randomly generated events... There is one where you can straight up get captured and have to break yourself. I did yourself that. Free. I love that that is just a random event because almost every other game, that would be a prescripted thing that happens one time, never happens again. Instead, yeah. they made that its whole little mission type. And it could happen over and over again if you stumble into the trap again, over and over again. No, it, and that's such a nice thing is they've, they, and that kind of stuff happens less as you destroy the bandit camps. Right, And at the start of the game, when you're driving around the woods, at any given moment, you could just run into eight or nine zombies just roaming the countryside. And at, especially at the start of the game, that's a real threat. But as you play the game and destroy infestations and start killing hordes, you're just not going to see the same density of zombies anymore. I mean, you're going to see some more powerful zombies that have unlocked, unlocked over the course of the game, which I won't spoil. Well, I can spoil a little. Those uh, Reacher zombies are really annoying, but in a satisfying way to kill. Oh, yeah. I, with that, that introductory mission, it's like, my gosh, they're essentially introducing the Predator and the Wolfman as an enemy type. I know. <laughs> I'm like, there's a, there's a Yeti attacking me. I don't know if I can cope with this. <laughs> I love that scene, though. That's such a good mission. Mm, and you wonder, yeah. like, isn't it a little late in the game to be introducing new monsters? I'm like, no, because this game wants to keep you entertained the entire length of the game, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it oh, wants yeah. To keep seeing new things your entire time with the game, and you really do keep seeing new things the entire There's length of the game. There's new things in the epilogue for crying out loud. I know. Uh, which which brings me to my uh, my big question. That's one hell of a sequel hook, huh? Oh and my gosh, What yes. do like, you think not, of that sequel hook? I'm not going to tell anyone what happens no. because they need to see it, but like, okay, now I see the payoff. And, and the thing is, what I love is they do it in a way that's rather similar to how they hinted at Trinity in uh, the Tomb Raider reboot. There were a bunch yes. of folks that would hint at that. The thing is, instead of just one random nod, it's like, no, this is actually a payoff to a current plot thread and perfectly setting up what the next one will be, because, oh gosh, please tell me that there is going to be another one. We need another one. No, honestly, like, they they need to make another one of these games. It, that being said, okay, the game has a perfect ending. Oh, yeah. It if, really if, does. If it has a perfect ending, and if they never make another one of these, I'm going to be completely satisfied with the uh, the with the next one. with With what I've got... I'm going to be perfectly satisfied if they never make another one. But I will say this. It is rare, as you say. I'm not going to spoil what it is, because you can have beaten the game and not see the sequel hook. It happens, as you said, after the end of the game. So all I will say about the sequel hook is I had no idea it was coming, and the genius of the sequel hook is that it makes 
perfect sense based on one of the game's storylines. Oh, like, yeah. When you get to the sequel, if you're like, oh my god, that's what they've been building up to this whole time. Because there's tons of you dialogue didn't lines, even notice and it. Logs. Yeah, it, like if you pay attention, you get you see the hints. Yeah, you will see the hints. And so it blindsided me that I'm like, oh my god, so that's what that meant. And oh, the payoff is so beautiful. And yeah, it is rare to end a game and be just immediately saying, okay, next one, please. <laughs> But that is exactly what I felt. And I hope this thing is selling well enough and will continue to sell well enough that they can justify making that next one. Because who boy, and, is um, it something else? The one thing I want to last emphasize here is the people who made this, while, well, yes, they made Siphon Filter back in the day, in between there, they mostly made handheld games. Like, they did stuff for Sony for, like, you know, they did a few extra Siphon Filters that you could play on the go, and they made Uncharted Golden Abyss, which, if you haven't played, is, like, the second best Uncharted game out before, you know, Lost Legacy. Because... Yeah, I've heard people love that Golden Abyss. I haven't played it because, you know, I just, I don't play portable games. But I, everybody tells me it's amazing. Oh, yeah, they actually made their big gameplay be neat. You actually do a little bit of archaeology for once in an Uncharted game. Like, That's this so is... unlike Uncharted. Yeah, and it, they actually put that much thought into it, and... That's what also made me curious, which is like, this is a studio that for the longest time they've been waiting for a really big comeback, and my gosh, is this it. And I'm confused that some people say, are the launch day issues fixed? Supposedly there was some issue with the launch day build. I've not been able to find anything personally regarding this, but um, right. if you were worried about that... Whatever it was does not exist anymore. Like yeah, whatever this game's early, if it had a hiccup, I I mean I didn't notice. I didn't go back and research reviews because you know me, I don't read reviews if there's a chance I'm going to play a game because I want my own review to not be touched, uh -huh. right, and not be influenced by other people's opinions on it. And I I always knew there was a chance I was going to be reviewing this thing because it's about zombies and bikers, and I just. <laughs> That's exactly my wheelhouse. Uh, Off-road uh, off biking and zombies. Yeah, that's my, every dream coming true simultaneously. But <laughs> the thing is, I didn't get around to playing it, so I just I never heard any of the early reviews. But hopefully they were largely glowing. And I can agree with you that if there is a bug in this game, I sure as hell didn't find it. Like, yeah, I mean, it's a giant open world game, so if you play it too long... Like, well, yeah, law of averages. You're gonna have loading issues, like um, places where it forgets to load textures. But that's just the nature... That happens with basically every video game. If you play it too long at a stretch, eventually the code is gonna get... There's no good way to describe this, so I'll just say it. The code is going to get tired, and it's going <laughs> to start not loading textures. I've got a bunch of video clips of textures not loading, and honestly, they're all pretty funny. But And this is the key to the game. You can save whenever you want, so that's not an issue. Yeah. Imagine How many that, games? a console game where you can just save, where yeah, you can quit anytime saving. your bike. Yeah, like literally anytime saving in this game. And you play it, and you're like... Why do not? Why do more games not have any time saving? Like I just don't get it. It's such. I mean, it's it so transforms the game experience. You don't have to worry about checkpoints. You don't have to worry about getting back to a base. You're like, no, I'm ready to stop playing. Or no, I want to do something stupid, and you just save it, and then you pick up after you've done the stupid thing. That is the kind of gameplay we should be encouraging. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. uh, by the way, biggest game changer for how you play the game, uh, if you do all of the, just a little tip to everybody, if you haven't done all the open world stuff, if you do, if you complete all of the ambush camps in the game, uh, your reward for that, I was hoping there would be more fantastical weapons. I keep hoping for a, um, a, an awesome melee weapon that never run, that never gets damaged that you can just use forever, or maybe a laser rifle of some kind. And I don't know that I'm ever going to get it. I'm probably not. But one thing you do get that completely changes how the game is played is you can get, if you defeat all the ambush camps, you get a permanently silenced rifle. So you get a, an assault rifle that does not make a sound when it shoots. And it completely transforms taking on enemies in New Game Plus. Like, mm -hmm. it is a totally new experience if you don't have to worry about blasting away with your assault rifle while you're playing new game, uh, while you're attacking uh, any human enemies in the game. So, yeah, it's it's a huge deal. I mean, it helps with um, hordes too, 
because you can follow a horde and just constantly like shoot the guys <laughs> at the back of the horde and the rest of the horde will not know you're there. So as long as you've got assault rifle ammo, you can pretty much just thin out a horde at your leisure. But yeah, it completely changes how you play the game and I think it's a really nice development. So yeah, uh, way to go on that front, guys. And the last thing I want to say uh, as we're wrapping things up is um, be sure to loot everybody in all <laughs> the Nero camps. If you oh, see yes, in white yes. suits, mm. just trust me here. It'll give you something and you won't be sure what it's for. Trust me, you want it for by the end of the game. Yeah, you desperately need it at the end of the game. <clears throat> and it can be a little difficult to find. Uh, some of them, and I'll give you a little hint here. Some of them are a little difficult to find, right? But uh, what you will learn is that luckily on your minimap, any body you haven't searched will be marked by a white X on your minimap, right? And so normally you kill a bandit, you kill a ripper. Oh, there's a white X on my minimap now. Uh, and it's easy enough to find exactly what you're looking for. But these guys, there are cor there, these guys are corpses that are already dead when the game starts, so you aren't necessarily going to be looking for them. So keep your eye out for white X's on the map, whether or not you've killed everybody. And this is whenever you're in a Nero camp, uh, one of their bases. This is whenever you're at a Nero crash site, whenever you're at a Nero research site. Anytime you're, like, there are 18 things, and we're not going to tell you what, there are 18 things you have to pick up, and there are 18 injectors in the game. So if you found a place where you get an injector to increase your stats, there's also an item there you need to find represented by a white X on the map. Be okay. sure to find it while you're first going to those Nero sites, because it is going to be a bitch to track them down later. Yep. Yeah, because, um, spoiler alert, the Nero sites disappear from the map after you've explored them. Yeah. It's, uh, it's frustrating. But At yeah, least most so of them sure open up as fast travel points. That's the one upside. Well, yeah, no, uh, like half of them open up as fast travel points, but all of the helicopter crashes, the oh, research yeah, sites yeah. Uh, don't. So that's a full half of them that if you didn't find it the first time, you're going to have a hell of a time finding it the second time. So be careful. All right, so that's that. I hope that if you listen to the rest of this without playing Days Gone, we haven't spoiled everything. But even if we have... This is 100% a game worth playing. It's one of the best games of 2019. Full stop, the best zo open world zombie game I've ever played. And just every part of it is a pleasure. Like, list, look at how little we had to complain about in the complaints section. I, there's just nothing. It's, it's just a great game in every conceivable way. And everybody needs to give it a shot. And I do want to say, if you're worried about the time investment, the beautiful thing is, it, as we said, it is broken up into sections. So you could play this game conceivably for a bit, and then when you finish the first arc, okay, you take a break for a bit, you swap to something else, then you come back again, do the next story arc, go away, come back again, and it will still work perfectly well. Yeah, no, it's... Um, every part of this is... It's accessible, right? It's easy to jump into. Honestly, it just in a way that few survival games, few open world games, and few zombie games do, it just fundamentally makes itself very easy to play, right? You can just jump into this and be guaranteed you're going to have a great time. So yeah, Days Gone, whether or not I like the title, I don't think it's great. Uh, definitely one of the best games of 2019 and an absolute must own if you have a playstation 4 and uh like on a bridge just said might be worth buying a ps4 just to get it. <laughs> so keep that in mind all right uh so what would you like people to check out on a bridge before we go all right well um as always you can check me out on escapist where i have my column second look and i've also been doing some extra stuff i just as of this recording did a preview of the upcoming gtfo infection update that's coming up and they're doing some really crazy stuff with that they're apparently tossing out all their old content and putting completely new content in which like not many multiplayer games huh. that is doing and all sorts of crazy stuff like that so be sure to check that out and as always 
check out Unabridged Gamer. I am very close. We're talking like dangerously close to finally having some new stuff published. So I'm Woo-hoo! very excited for that and uh, finally get things rolling there. And um, something that I've been working on behind the scenes should make that a lot easier in general. So very excited. Very much just everywhere else, Underbridge Gamer, Twitter, all the different social medias. If I'm there, it's Underbridge Gamer. Okay. So be sure to check that out. And for me, uh, there's buttons coming up. If you have any questions or suggestions, drop them in the comment section below the video. Oh, here's one of those corpses we were talking about. Uh, that's the other thing. Um, they're always, uh, their security guys are dressed in yellow. You want the corpses dressed in white case that wasn't already clear but as you can see there was a thing on my map then i picked up the item now the x is gone and you know i've successfully collected it so just do that 18 times and you are going to have a ball with what you uncover uh but for now i've been the uh well yeah i already did that part that's embarrassing uh, <laughs> click on the buttons we'll see you back here for more but until then i'm going to say that's right au revoir <laughs>